Turning Tides is an Antics Entertainment affiliate. You can find us on social media at The Turning Tides Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and at Turning Tides Pod on Twitter. For more information, or if you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, please contact us at the turning tides podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Warning this episode of Turning Tides contains graphic descriptions of murder, violence, sexual assault, rape, suicide, and animal abuse. Fueled by religious humanitarianism, reformist politicians, and a growing support for social movements, the American progressive era strive to reform the cruel nature of American governance. The progressive movement was equally fed by millions of immigrants from Europe who often lived and worked in squalor and, quote, cultural isolation, unquote. For example, in 1907, 1,285,000 people arrived in the United States. They largely came from Southern and Eastern Europe, but there were also many Japanese and Chinese peoples who arrived in America during this time as well. This new influx of migrants, coupled with social Darwinist politicians, created a perfect storm for reform movements, and they easily gained traction. Muckraker journalists, deemed thus by high society because they weren't afraid to go to any length to find the truth, gained an avid readership. This helped propel the United States into a new era of investigative journalism. Lincoln Steffens, Jacob Rees, and Upton Sinclair are some of the most well-known of these journalists. Philip Dre says progressives believed, quote, great wrongs could result not solely from conscious acts, but also from decisions made by faceless institutions, corporate boards, the courts, and neglectful government agencies, unquote. This helps explain why trade unions exploded in popularity throughout the early 1900s, why many of the unions which were founded on this wobbly foundation still exist. Two of the most influential progressives during this era were Sidney and Beatrice Webb, Their book, Industrial Democracy, was a revelation to many. In it, the husband and wife team argue for the necessity of trade and labor unions. 20th century corporations were simply too powerful. A counterbalance was necessary. Credited with coining the phrase collective bargaining, they believed only through democratization and the unionization of workers and the workplace could capitalism ever hope to function on an ethical level? If monopolists and industrialists fail to offer these minimal reforms, social revolution would be just around the corner. Indeed, throughout the country, more people than ever were espousing socialist ideas. Appeal to Reason was a nationally published socialist newspaper which had 500,000 readers and was headquartered in Kansas. By 1912, over 1,000 socialists held public office in the United States. They served many roles in their local governments. In the same year, Eugene Debs had won 6% of the national vote. The ruling classes of the country needed to embrace some sort of reform while still saving face. Their solution was scientific management. They would use this blanket term to create vague efficacy models for their businesses, which they claimed would help their employees. Throughout the world, reformism was coming into vogue. In England, a socialist named William Morris was gaining traction with his arts and crafts movement. It sought to bring labor back to the days when work was individualistic and done at home for the betterment of all. In America, his work inspired the City Beautiful movement. This was one of the first active attempts made by local governments to enhance the natural beauty of their cities and towns. Examples of the City Beautiful movement include the Denver Civic Center and Benjamin Franklin Parkway in Philadelphia. Employers quickly followed the shifting tides. 
Some might have been genuinely concerned about the people they employed, but most saw minuscule reforms as a way to control labor agitation as well as save some money. This was referred to as welfare capitalism. In layman's terms, you give a little up front to save a lot in the long run. Designed initially as a prophylactic, welfare capitalism would soon explode in popularity throughout the quote-unquote industrialized world. A prime example of welfare capitalism is U.S. Steel. They offered workers pension plans and even stock options. However, the most adamant welfare capitalist ended up being John H. Patterson. He was the owner of the National Cash Register in Dayton, Ohio. Philip Dre says that, quote, Patterson introduced free child care, after-work education, organized sports teams, an on-site medical clinic, as well as split shifts for female employees so they could arrive and depart the plant independently of men, unquote. Frederick W. Taylor was another influential voice in the welfare capitalist movement. His aforementioned scientific management was cold and efficient. Insisting that workers did not know what was best for them, Taylor believed all labor issues could be fixed with a mathematical formula. On the subject, Taylor said, quote, What constitutes a fair day's work will be a question of scientific investigation, instead of a subject to be bargained and haggled over, unquote. The AFL was not convinced by these ruthless arguments. When Taylor even suggested a sliding pay scale based on worker ability, the AFL balked. Samuel Gompers said that Taylor was attempting to turn human workers into, quote, mere machines. Science would thus get the most of workers before they are sent to the junk pile, unquote. Taylor claimed his methods were designed to prevent such things, but his anti-union sentiments were obvious. Additionally, many of his critics considered his method to be little more than pseudoscience. However, the business class latched on to many of his theories, and it is partially due to Taylor that we have modern-day business colleges. In 1898, tensions flared in the labor movement again, as eight strikers and five mine guards were killed in the Battle of Virden, Illinois. This battle was part of a larger coal mine war, which was being waged in Illinois between striking miners and private detectives. The battle began because the industrialists brought in black people as strike breakers, only further degrading intersectional cooperation in the labor movement. The tensions between white and black laborers only grew exceedingly worse and more horrific with time. In Wilmington, North Carolina, Gatling guns were used to murder upwards of 300 black people, while 2,000 were made refugees. In Panna, Illinois, white unionists murdered five black strike breakers who were brought in from Alabama. The new century brought more of the same in New Orleans as well. Following a mass shooting committed by a black man, the white population descended on black schools and churches, killing indiscriminately. Accurate death tallies are still unknown. In Evansville, Indiana, a shootout between the police and a black man culminated in the deaths of police officers and the accused. This was not enough for the town, as they went on to take the lives of 12 more of their black neighbors. Following reports of rapes committed by black people in Atlanta in early fall of 1906, white mobs killed, beat, and tortured over 100 black people. In Brownsville, Texas, Teddy Roosevelt dishonorably discharged over 100 Buffalo soldiers after false reports of violence being committed by the troops. In Springfield, Illinois... 5,000 white people descended on black neighborhoods, destroying the vibrant communities there. At least 16 people died, while over 2,000 were displaced entirely. In Reno, Nevada, one of the first great boxing fights was taking place between Jack Johnson and James J. Jeffries. Jeffries had come out of retirement for the sole purpose of, quote, beating a black man in the ring, unquote. 
saying he was going to, quote, prove a white man is better than a black man, unquote. Dubbed the fight of the century, anticipation mounted as racists across the country threw their support behind the great white hope. The fight lasted 15 rounds and ended with the TKO of the Great White Hope. Black communities celebrated the victory across the country. White people were so enraged that one of the great boxing legends of all time beat an old, washed-up boxer that they began a series of race riots across the country, culminating in the deaths of over 20 people. In Forsyth County, Georgia, racial violence was continuous for months during 1912. Houses were dynamited, livestock were killed, and threatening notices were dispersed by men calling themselves night riders. Over 98% of the black people living in Forsyth County fled their homes. This time period is summed up well by the genius writer, thinker, and philosopher W.E.B. Du Bois. He said in 1905, quote, The black race in America, stolen, ravished, and degraded, struggling up through difficulties and oppression, needs sympathy and receives criticism, needs help and is given hindrance, needs protection and is given mob violence, needs justice and is given charity, needs leadership and is given cowardice and apology, needs bread and is given a stone. This nation will never stand justified before God until these things are changed. There were few, if any, white allies who could be numbered among the voices of the labor movement. One of the few was Eugene Debs, who was sometimes attacked by fellow union members for being too interested in the liberation of black people. He wrote on the subject in 1903, quote, But while the white man is considerate enough to tolerate black men in their place, the remotest suggestion at social recognition arouses all the pent-up wrath of his Anglo-Saxon civilization. And my observation is that the less real ground there is for such indignant assertion of self-superiority, the more passionately it is proclaimed." Debs then recounts a story of a recent trip to Texas where he, quote, passed four or five bearers of the white man's burden, perched on a railing and decorating their environment with tobacco juice. One of the men addressed Debs, saying, quote, there's a black man that'll carry your grips. A second one added, that's what he's there for. And the third chimed in with, that's right, by God. Here was a savory bouquet of white superiority. One glance was sufficient to satisfy me that they represented all there is of justification for the implacable hatred of the black race. They were ignorant, lazy, unclean, totally void of ambition, themselves the foul product of the capitalist system, and held in lowest contempt by the master class. Unquote. Unfortunately, Debs closes the same address by claiming that racism is solely a product of capitalism, and that when capitalism is extinguished, racism would be stomped out with it. Therefore, fighting specifically for the liberation and rights of black people was, in his view, counterproductive to the labor movement. As the labor wars waged on, the new century brought many of the old problems with it to the ever-troublesome anthracite region of Pennsylvania. Following the murder of 19 mostly Slavic miners, the United Mine Workers, or UMW, were due for a change in leadership. The moderate John Mitchell was chosen to become the UMW's fifth president. In the wake of his election, new strikes were planned in the hopes of winning a wage increase, lower hours, and union recognition. Following the Pullman strike, all parties were keenly aware that some form of neutral group should exist to adjudicate labor unrest. The National Civic Federation was designed for this purpose. Composed of business leaders, lawmakers, and labor activists, it was one of the first genuine attempts made by the powers that be 
to recognize organized labor as an equal partner in negotiations. In 1900, the national elections were just around the corner when trouble in Pennsylvania's coal country started up once more. All inroads were made to keep the strike away from national headlines, and they quickly reached a two-year settlement. President McKinley needn't worry about his re-election chances. The jingoism which pervaded the country in the wake of the Spanish-American War was still ripe, and it helped carry McKinley smoothly into a second term. Handling crises spanning the globe, he decided to catch some fresh air in Buffalo, which was holding the 1901 World's Fair. During the meet-and-greet, the Secret Service had become lax about the rules for approaching the president. A man named Leon Cholgosh approached with his right arm bandaged. Seeing this, President McKinley reached for the man's left hand, when suddenly two shots rang out. Leon had wrapped a pistol in cloth to give the impression of a cast over his right hand. A man standing behind Leon, James Parker, leapt into action, striking Leon and disarming him as the Secret Service began to swarm the two. Leon was an anarchist who was heavily inspired by the words of Emma Goldman. This was his attentat, or attack, his propaganda by deed. A grand jury quickly indicted the man following McKinley's agonizing death. Leon was sentenced to be electrocuted to death. Prominent lawyers like Clarence Darrow stepped in to try and stop the death penalty from being carried out. Many doctors supported the prognosis that Leon was insane. In spite of his probable insanity, the death penalty was upheld. Leon's last words before being electrocuted thrice by 1,800 volts of electricity were, quote, I shot the president because I thought it would help the working people and for the sake of the common people. I am not sorry for my crime. I am awful sorry because I could not see my father, unquote. James Parker, the man who attempted to save the president's life, spent the following years lecturing about the president throughout the eastern seaboard. Following this, not much is known of him. He became a vagrant, and by 1907, he would be dead after being deemed insane. Having no one to claim his remains, they were sent to a medical college and dissected by students there. In 1902, the deal the UMW had made with coal mine operators was expiring, and the new president, Theodore Roosevelt, could see the problems spiraling all around him. The miners felt they were being treated as little more than, quote, sharecroppers, unquote. Mine operators felt their company towns and the meager wages paid to their employees were highly acceptable. The impasse was impossible to surmount, and a region-wide strike was called for early June 1902. The loss of anthracite coal would be a serious burden on the nation, and the miners understood this. Anthracite coal burns much better than bituminous coal. Shortages would have huge effects on mass industry, and the poor especially. Theodore Roosevelt was, for his part, not anti-union. He famously said, quote, I strongly favor labor unions. If I were a wage worker in a big city, I should certainly join one, unquote. Additionally, Roosevelt was rather smitten with UMW President John Mitchell, who grew up in the mines but was soft-spoken and careful in his rhetoric. In many ways, Mitchell was the man Roosevelt always pretended to be. Unfortunately, Roosevelt's pro-union feeling extended only as far as he liked that specific union's president or message. Regardless, as the great anthracite strike of 1902 began, coal and railroad operators doubled down on their anti-union sentiment they refused to even acknowledge the union's existence. At the heart of the coal miner's strike was the closed shop system. This system ensured that employers agreed to only hire union men and disbar any non-union workers. For unions, the closed shop was essential because without it, they could not guarantee representation to all workers, and they would lose a good deal of their bargaining power. The owners saw this as pure chaos, 
They used clever language and appealed to worker individualism to dissuade the closed shop, coming up with their own system called Open Shop. Knowing how powerful phraseology was when it came to persuading hearts and minds, Samuel Gompers retooled the phrase. Union Shop was the term he created. This debate still rages. Conservatives use their open shop model to show that unions are actually undemocratic. Unions, on the other hand, say the union shop model is democracy in the workplace incarnate. Workers could only hope to have a voice if they stood strong with a union. As the coal strike wore on, both sides continued to stonewall each other. The public stepped in and demanded arbitration. Roosevelt feared his new presidency would flounder into social war and coal riots immediately. In a truly historic move, he called both sides to a meeting. The government and Roosevelt could no longer sit idly by and watch the country collapse and coal prices skyrocket. Mitchell was shocked that organized labor was being given a seat at the table in negotiations at all. He said he'd put 125,000 miners back to work immediately if coal operators simply allowed Roosevelt to decide terms. George F. Bayer, president of the Reading, Pennsylvania Railroad, would have none of it. He advised the president to, quote, put federal troops in the field, unquote. Bayer's contemptuous attitude toward unions was on full display. He would not even acknowledge Mitchell's presence in the room. Roosevelt was highly irritated by Bayer's complete and utter arrogance, saying later, quote, if it wasn't for the high office I hold, I would have taken him by the seat of the breeches and the nape of the neck and chucked him out of the window, unquote. I would give a rather large sum of money to see such a scene. In the end, Roosevelt dispatched an underling to J.P. Morgan's yacht. Morgan had massive interests in both the coal industry and the railroads. He put forward a plan wherein Roosevelt would create a strike commission, which would bang out a deal over the union and mine operators' heads. The commission went to work very quickly, and they quote-unquote awarded the striking miners a 10% pay hike, an 8- to 9-hour day, and a permanent six-man mediation board designed to handle all future labor disputes. It was seemingly a win-win. The operators didn't have to acknowledge the union, and the miners received somewhat better pay and lessened working hours. Roosevelt came out looking the best in all of this, as the country saw him as a president who got things done. Having won such recognition from the government, union rights seemed to be ascending. However, not all was as it seemed. In the courtrooms of the United States, conservative judges time and again sided with big business. Samuel Gompers was at a loss of what to do, saying, quote, What chance have labor and the laborers, for fair play, when the whole history of jurisprudence has been against the laborer. There never was a tyrant in the history of the world but who found some judge to clothe in judicial form the tyranny exercised and the cruelty imposed on the people. Unquote. There were steps forward, like the Erdman Act of 1898, which acknowledged unions, offered federal arbitration as an option, and ceased yellow dog contracts. These contracts had forced new employees into waiving any union representation upon hire. However, America's courts stepped in to shield big business. In Lochner v. New York, the court sided with a baker who worked far longer than state law allowed. Inexplicably, using the 14th Amendment which was originally designed to protect those who had been enslaved, the court claimed the legislature had no place interfering with the baker's choice to work in whatever conditions he agreed upon with his employer, whether or not those conditions were unsanitary. Weird flex. They claimed that because of the 14th Amendment, state governments had, quote, no right whatsoever, unquote, to interfere with, quote, the liberty of contract, unquote, even if public health and safety was on the line. The great dissenter, John Marshall Harlan, could not have disagreed more. 
he felt it was entirely the job of the legislature to regulate unsafe industries, and that the case before them had nothing to do with the courts. Lochner turned the clock back on years of uphill struggle for the labor movement. Beyond that, it started a whole judicial trend of subverting the gains of organized labor. Adair v. United States struck down the yellow dog clauses in the Erdman Act. Now an employer could force prospective hires into disavowing union membership, simply because they could. By the 1920s, the courts were even striking down minimum wage laws. This period, well into the day, demonstrates the ineptitude of a system in which five almighty justices decide the fate of an entire country full of people. In Lowe v. Lawler, the courts took aim at union-authorized boycotts. Apparently, boycotts were in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. Go figure. Philip Dre says Lowe was entitled to, quote, collect triple financial damages from the members of the United Hatters local, to the point of attaching individual bank accounts and threatening foreclosure on more than 2,000 worker homes, unquote. The AFL stepped in and raised money for the Hatters' quote-unquote damages. Gompers and the AFL were in the court's crosshair shortly after, they found him and his new vice president, John Mitchell, guilty of violating the Sherman Antitrust Act. The violation carried with it a possible year-long jail sentence for the moderate union leader. These criminal charges were dropped, but the court still upheld its decision. Union boycotts against big business were illegal. In spite of the repeated roadblocks put in the way of meaningful reform, there were plenty of progressive policies which slipped through the cracks, especially in the state legislature. One of the main issues of the time was child labor, and without the voice of Mother Jones, child labor might still be as horrific today as it was during this period. Mary G. Harris Jones lived through the Great Chicago Fire, the 1877 railroad strike, the Haymarket Affair, Coxey's unemployed armies, and the Pullman strikes. These events were the bedrock of her ideological foundations. Near the end of her life, she came fully into her own, embracing her mother Jones' persona to the nines. In 1903, at age 73, she led striking children to the Long Island home of Theodore Roosevelt. Borrowing animal cages from a local carnival, Jones illustrated her point graphically. She put the striking children into the cages, with the banners strewn across them reading, quote, We want time to play, unquote. A flustered Roosevelt refused to meet with the children, but the publicity from the children's march was a game changer. Child labor became a divisive issue. Previously, people were content to ignore the fact that their clothes and tools were created by children as young as seven who were denied an education. 1941 would be the first time America upheld restrictions on children under the age of 16 working. Today, child labor laws are being pushed back once more due to a claimed labor shortage. Politicians who claim children are needed in the workforce are delusional at best and insidious at worst. When children begin work at a young age, it can be justified as a way to imbue them with confidence or strong work ethic. But it, in fact, can also hinder their development and their acknowledgement of their own self-worth outside of a workplace. In 1908, the upcoming election was weighing heavily on the mind of Samuel Gompers. He went to the major parties and begged them to include union rights on their respective platforms in return for unconditional support. The Democrats, under William Jennings Bryan, said they would include union rights in their party's platform. Unfortunately, Bryan was trounced, only able to secure the solid South against William Howard Taft, who had the overwhelming support of the business elite and Republicans at large. Four years later, Woodrow Wilson was the Democratic choice. He also said he would support workers' rights. In a very muddled election, Wilson became the first Democrat elected since Grover Cleveland. American politics, far from being a static thing, 
were very changeable, with nearly every decade seeing a flip in power structure and party ideologies. To illustrate the point, Grover Cleveland, a Democrat, was the president who violently shut down the Pullman strikes, while only a generation later, Woodrow Wilson would become one of the great champions of working rights in his early tenure as a Democratic president. It's also worth pointing out that while being a champion for working rights, he only cared about white working rights. Wilson is probably one of the most disgustingly racist presidents in American history, claiming the white supremacist movie Birth of a Nation was, quote, all true, unquote. One of Wilson's first acts as commander-in-chief was to create the modern income tax while lowering American tariffs. Next, he created the modern-day Federal Reserve Bank. His most important labor rights contribution, however, was the creation of the Department of Labor, headed by former Union Treasurer William Wilson, and the codifying of the Clayton Antitrust Act. Philip Dre says the Clayton Act, quote, granted unions relief from abusive injunctions under Sherman. Enthusiasm proved premature, as the law held out several exemptions under which injunctions still could be used. Unquote. On top of the codification of the Clayton Antitrust Act, there was also the kern mcgillicuddy Act, which established compensation laws for workers. In terms of overall effect, many consider the Wilson administration and the progressive era to be the cornerstone of the future New Deal. In New York City, one of the key moments in the progressive era was about to take place. The recently founded International Ladies Garment Workers Union, or ILGWU, initiated an impromptu strike of over 20,000 mostly female textile workers. Textile work was shoddy in New York, and often seasonal, some factories consisted of a handful of workers and a couple of sewing machines. In many cases, smaller factories were given work from larger entities and created a single style of zipper or a specific collar. These subcontractors, in turn, subcontracted their work to their laborers. Every piece fashioned and every zipper rigged were haggled down by bosses to save a modicum of inconsistent profit while workers begged for a few extra cents, often to their detriment. This sweating of labor for every piece is where the term sweatshop comes from. Women workers toiled at the same rate as the original laborers of Lowell, Massachusetts, working from 8 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., six days per week. They were paid anywhere from $8 to $13 per week. If you belonged to a smaller shop, you were paid per piece created, forcing long hours and shoddy workmanship. Workers were charged for the needle and thread they used, and they were crammed together, literally working back to back. Bathroom breaks were discouraged or outright forbidden, and sexual assault and harassment were rampant. Those who complained were not only fired, they were blacklisted and forced into a new career entirely. 50% of the women were Russian and Ukrainian Jewish peoples. Another 33% were Southern and Tyrolese Italians. Few spoke English, and few could communicate across such large cultural gaps. They inhabited ethnic slums in New York City's Lower East Side. However, the oppression these women endured bound them together, in spite of their many differences. The striking began at Rosen Brothers, when both contractor and seamstress walked off the job together to protest declining rates for the pieces they created. It began a five-week work stoppage, which forced the two Rosen brothers into granting several concessions to the union. Seeing this encouraging sign, other women textile workers struck at the Triangle Shirtwaist Company and Lasersons. At the Triangle, the company had created its own corporate union or association, which doled out favors to, quote, faithful workers, unquote. This irked many, who met off-site to discuss their grievances. When the meeting was discovered, many involved were fired. In September, the strike was called. Triangle resisted and imported not workers 
but garments from their Philadelphia shops. Marching alongside the ILGWU was the Women's Trade Union League, mainly consisting of upper-middle-class liberal reformers. Its founding members would go on to help found the NAACP. Striking together, the women workers were met by company toughs, who were often hired from the street. This policy of beating up young women did not play well in the press, and many were turned sympathetic because of corporate actions. The operators were losing ground. They turned to the law and said the women picketers were trespassing. The women responded by saying they were participating in a cherished First Amendment right. In late November, the garment workers met in Cooper Union to discuss the prospects of expanding the strikes across the whole industry. The droning speeches which followed were driving Clara Lemlik, Ukrainian Jewish immigrant, up the wall. She leapt to the stage between speakers and said, quote, I am a working girl, one of those who are on strike against intolerable conditions. I have listened to all the speakers, and I have no further patience for talk. What we are here for is to decide whether we shall or shall not strike. I offer a resolution that a general strike be declared now, unquote. The assembled became enraptured at the young woman's call to action. A resolution was quickly passed for a strike, and the mass of textile workers took, quote, the old Jewish oath, unquote. Standing firmly together, they recited the words, quote, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand wither, may my tongue forget speech, unquote. Bound in religious commitment, 15,000 Jewish women struck the next morning, crippling the entire New York City textile industry. Female workers and scabs participated in general melees in the streets. In one instance, a sole male had to be saved from the fury of the melee. The press called these instances of violence, quote, Amazonian attacks, unquote. By Christmas, almost 800 people had been arrested. Among them were two young women accused of stabbing a factory owner with hairpins. On January 2, 1910, hundreds participated in an impromptu pageant. Women walked the runway adorned with sashes saying arrested or workhouse prisoner. The months of striking and solidarity made these women tough as nails. One account says, quote, I have observed a Jewish girl with her arm around an Italian girl's neck, not able to speak one to the other, but both understanding they are fighting the same fight for each other's interest, unquote. The strike was spreading, and workers in Philadelphia agreed to strike in support, further limiting the options for the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. In the end, many middling and smaller shops agreed to the workers' demands, and most textile factories in New York City were now operating on a closed shop model. Triangle Shirtwaist would outlast the strikers and not succumb to any of the workers' demands for improved safety conditions. In 1910, the cloakmakers began a strike with the ILGWU's support. Forces came together to arbitrate. One of them was attorney Louis Brandeis. Brandeis had become famous after arguing the Supreme Court case Muller v. Oregon. In this case, Brandeis claimed that women working long hours was injurious to the public good, and their roles as caretakers and providers meant they needed a lesser workload. In a complete about-face, the court agreed with Brandeis. Apparently, health can be regulated by the state as long as women are involved. Most remembered from this case is the Brandis Brief, in which Brandis used extensive data and research to prove his point, instead of legal arguments and precedent. Something similar would help prove the point of Thurgood Marshall in Marshall v. Board of Education years later. Back in 1910, the closed shop, open shop debate was the main sticking point for both sides in the cloakmaker's strike. Brandis put forth a novel compromise, the preferential shop. As it implies, 
the preferential shop granted preferential treatment and employment toward union workers, but it did not give the union complete control. Newspapers called the preferential shop, quote, the protocol of peace, unquote, and both sides begrudgingly agreed to the compromise terms. It was a complete win for thousands of New York's garment workers. When 1911 began, however, a catastrophe would grip the entire city. The non-union Triangle Shirtwaist Factory did not have to yield to wage increases or shortened hours. On the afternoon of March 25, 1911, perhaps 700 people were bustling throughout the building, and many had already been working for at least eight hours. On the eighth floor, a fire started, possibly from a discarded cigarette igniting scraps of fabric. Workers attempted to contain the flames in vain. In the five minutes it took to raise the alarm, the fire had become a raging inferno, which was being fed by the very garments with which workers labored. Luckily, there was a convenient door to a wide stairwell. However, to discourage breaks, this door was locked from the outside. Panic began and people rushed the only operating elevator. On the 10th floor, employees in the executive offices escaped via connecting roofs. But the hundreds on the 9th floor had no such escape route. Their only way to fresh air was via the now inoperable elevator or a flimsy, precariously placed fire escape. 30 women, seeing the fire rage toward them, attempted to jump onto the top of the elevator shaft. Their crushed and charred remains were discovered strewn together. On the street, the fire had begun to attract an audience. Firemen and first responders were unequipped to handle such a disaster. Their fire hoses only reached six stories high. Around this time, the first bundles began crashing to the pavement. Onlookers quickly came to realize that these bundles were the shattered remains of human beings, choosing to fall to earth rather than burn to death. Firemen attempted to use horse blankets and sheets of canvas to break the fall of the descending, to no avail. The next day, a reporter wrote, quote, I looked upon the heap of dead bodies, and I remembered these were the shirtwaist makers. I remembered their great strike of last year, in which these same girls had demanded more sanitary conditions and more safety precautions in the shops. These dead bodies were their answer, unquote. The devastation inside and outside the factory was horrific. Dozens were burned beyond recognition. There was no hope of identifying many of the bodies. Coins lay on the floor of the factory. The women had only just received their meager wages. Philip Dre says, quote, Some could only be identified by the names written on their pay envelopes. Unquote. 146 people were killed in the fire. As the details emerged, grief turned to anger and anger to vengeance. At a mass protest, a vehement Rose Schneiderman said, quote, I would be a traitor to those poor, burned bodies if I were to come here to talk good fellowship. I can't talk fellowship to you who are gathered here. Too much blood had been spilled. I know from experience it is up to the working people to save themselves. Unquote. In a final disgrace to the victims and their families, the two millionaires who ran the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory were acquitted of any and all wrongdoing. In a civil case years later, which finally put the matter to rest, the victims' families were awarded a paltry $75 apiece. Adjusted for inflation, this is about $2,200 today. As if to rub salt in the wound, the day before the fire which claimed 146 lives, the court stepped in to gut workers' rights once more. Ives v. South Buffalo Railway Co. shot down workplace compensation laws, which were attempting to place liability on the employers in the case of workplace accidents. The practice of compensating workers for accidents could hardly be considered revolutionary. 
In fact, many American social scientists use the example put forward by Otto von Bismarck in Germany as a case study. There was complete need for regulation between 1880 and 1910, as over 10,000 Americans were dying in workplace accidents yearly, and many thousands more were being maimed, crippled, disfigured, or injured. It's due to these early reforms that rail travel is one of the safest modes of transportation in America to this day. This standard only recently fell when Joe Biden broke up strikes which would have improved safety conditions for rail workers. In 1913, employers joined the push for safety, but they did it petulantly. Often blaming workers, they would use company propaganda and brochures to point out the dangers of being quote-unquote careless on the job. The Triangle Fire proved a decisive moment for America. Due to tireless efforts by activists, the New York Factory Investigating Committee was created which monitors factories and suggests actions to improve safety conditions. In all that had transpired, it was no wonder that a wholly radical and sometimes violent group of socialists in the mines, mills, and factories of America banded together to form an intersectional union. They called themselves the International Workers of the World, or the IWW. History remembers them as the Wobblies. The Old West, contrary to popular depiction in movies and television, was won as much by the coal miner as it was by the cowboy. The cowboy provided the means for the land to become quote-unquote tame, but the coal miner provided the cowboy with his pistol, bullets, knife, and fire. Contrary to popular musings, the crackling wood fire was not at all common in the Old West. The primary fuel was coal, which could be mined across the entire eastern spine of the Rocky Mountains, also known as the Front Range, from Idaho and Montana down to Colorado and New Mexico. Thick veins of coal lay dormant, ready to be excavated and then consumed for human ease. Coal is created through millions of years of pressure and weight. In its initial form, coal is the decomposed remnants of ancient plant matter, which has been denied sunlight and therefore rendered unable to break down naturally. When compressed under sediment over millions of years, it forms into peat. Peat is black, earthy, and easily broken apart. From here, based on a number of factors, the peat changes forming into one of several types of coal. The poorest quality is called lignite, or brown coal. It is almost always used as a cheap fuel for the agricultural industry. Early Mesoamericans used jet, a deep black version of lignite, to create exquisite jewelry. The term jet black is derived from this gemstone. Bituminous and subbituminous coal are described as forms of soft coal. These two types of middling quality coal are often used in power generation, but famously, both are used in coke fuel, which is a necessary component for any kind of smithing work. Anthracite is the most efficient of them all, sometimes called hard coal or Kilkenny coal, Anthracite was able to burn at a high temperature for a considerable amount of time, making it the most sought-after type of coal. Hotbeds of hard coal are located all over the world. Today, China has taken the lead on coal production, outpacing every nation combined in the rape of the natural world. Regardless, as the great northern forests were being decimated for wood fuel, the discovery of steam changed the energy-producing game. Lumber was too expensive at this point, and animal dung was not very pleasant to burn. Coal, however, was readily available for the enterprising and least frightened. The underground world changed the basic relationships that workers had with each other, with their animal cohorts, and with the very air they breathed. 
At any moment, a single careless mistake or pure chance could kill hundreds. Most early miners worked together in unofficial cooperatives and sold their easily picked coal by the pail for some spending money. They owned their own tools, made their own hours, and protected one another from a modicum of possible dangers. As the railroads grew in size, the thirst for coal became an insatiable need. The railroads, industry, agriculture, the armed forces, and even the coal mines themselves needed coal. More and more coal was sucked out of the earth. No longer were enterprising individuals mining coal at their own pace. Now massive conglomerates with millions of dollars were forcing men to meet increasingly outrageous mining tonnage quotas. These men often became miners as children, starting as breaker boys who sifted through the coal and shale at the mouth of the mine for a pittance. Soon, they would become drivers, having to work with mules who were unaccustomed to life underground and who could panic, kick, and bite with ruthless effect. Much like the mines in which they toiled, mules were aberrations, created by humans for human convenience. They were unable to reproduce and worked for scraps of food. Drivers were sometimes very cruel to their mules, beating them with whips and blunt force objects. To their reputation, mules remained stubborn. One miner says, quote, the animals were unionized before a lot of us, unquote. In this subterranean world, ethnicity, skin color, politics, and religious views mattered little. Besides each other, the miners had a sole friend, the mouse. Mice proved invaluable to miners, not just as a warning sign. The canary in the coal mine is the famous example of another small animal, which was used alongside miners to determine if working conditions were safe, but also as companions. Miners would sometimes name the mice they came into contact with and even feed them by hand. These vast labyrinths of tunnels, rooms, and byways were created and gridded out like a planned city. Miners were assigned rooms to work, with a partner and sometimes a trainee. Depending on the vein of coal you had to mine, your room could make or break your family's livelihood. Experienced mine bosses knew the best rooms and would give them out like rewards to workers who towed the line. In the worst cases... Miners pimped out daughters and wives for the opportunity to merely mine in a room with massive coal veins inside. At any moment, a volatile mix of chemicals could blow a room or an entire mine shaft sky high. These gases were studied and given names by experienced miners. Stink damp is the least dangerous. It's the result of blasting along with a number of other factors and it releases foul-smelling hydrogen sulfide into the air. Not necessarily dangerous, it could still sicken and overpower miners who were exposed to it. Black damp was more of an issue. This phenomenon occurs when carbon dioxide and nitrogen build up in abandoned sectors of the mine. As these chemicals built up, they would occasionally leak into working mine sectors. If not noticed quickly, one could asphyxiate and die. One of the worst ways to perish was through after damp. Thomas G. Andrews says it was, quote, a compound produced by the explosive combustion of gas and dust. After damp contained heavy concentrations of carbon monoxide. The majority of casualties in mine explosions probably resulted not from the force of the blasts, but rather from carbon monoxide poisoning as afterdamp seeped through the workings. Unquote. The scariest boogeyman for all miners, however, was fire damp, which was a volatile cocktail of methane and carbon monoxide. The methane had been lying dormant amongst the coal seams for millennia. A single spark and the entire mine could be gone in moments. This helps explain why the coal industry was wary about implementing newer technology, as it had the potential to blow up the mine if it let off a single spark.
the uprisings in Cour d'Alene and the anthracite region of Pennsylvania demonstrated how contemptuous the working relationships were between working peoples and their employers. The East and West would meet on June 27, 1905 in Chicago and found the IWW. Big Bill Haywood sat beside the frail Lucy Parsons, who shook hands with Daniel D. Leon, head of the Socialist Labor Party. This meeting of all points of the compass was called in the hopes of forming, quote, one big union, unquote, which would represent all industries, all trades, and all working peoples, even the unemployed. This would be the ultimate answer to the handful of monopolies which currently ran America. The IWW's preamble says, quote, The working class and the employing class have nothing in common. There can be no peace so long as hunger and want are found among millions of working people and the few who make up the employing class have all the good things in life, unquote. The IWW were openly antagonistic toward quote-unquote conservative unions like the AFL. For his part, Samuel Gompers considered the IWW a flash in the pan, saying, quote, The mountain labored and brought forth a mouse, unquote. The IWW was clearly something altogether different, and while never seriously rivaling the AFL for membership, they presented loud voices and bold ideas. They believed the union's duty was to strike for the workers it represented, and they would wield the strike weapon like a leveled spear. The union's stated goal was to turn the United States into a, quote, industrial commonwealth, unquote. They would achieve this commonwealth after, quote, a series of strikes leading to a general strike, which would force the capitalists to capitulate, unquote. The IWW promised to be the, quote, embryo, unquote, of this new society, retooling the lyrics to the famous socialist song, The Internationale. The final stanza goes, quote, "'Tis the final conflict. Let each stand in his place. The industrial union shall be the human race, unquote. The recent violent suppressions of laborers in Cordialine, Cripple Creek multiple times, and the anthracite showed the IWW where the cards were falling. They believed they could meet state-sponsored violence head-on. As 1905 wound down and gave way to 1906, a massive explosion rocked Caldwell, Idaho. Frank Stunenberg, former state governor, was mortally wounded in the blast. The man who planted the bomb said he killed the former governor because he denied him fractional ownership in a local mine. Brought in to investigate the attack was the famous Pinkerton detective James McParland. He went about interrogating the suspected bomber for over three days without legal counsel. During the course of this interrogation, the suspect went on to name many prominent union leaders as part of a vast conspiracy. McParland was attempting to use the same strategy he utilized to crush the Molly Maguire movement in the late 1870s. Bill Haywood was at a brothel in Denver when police first arrested him for conspiracy to commit murder. Alongside Big Bill, two other prominent union leaders were also arrested. Big Bill was the masculine hero of miners everywhere. His father was a Pony Express rider who died when he was only three. Philip Dre says that his mother remarried and moved Bill to Ophir, quote, a rough-and-tumble Utah mining camp. At age seven, the boy permanently blinded himself in one eye while carving a slingshot. Two years later, he left school and went to work in an Ophir silver mine. Unquote. He joined the Western Federation of Miners in 1893, and Big Bill found himself all over the West, attempting to organize Union sympathizers and dodge unsympathetic militia companies. Roosevelt could not stand the organizer and called him a, quote, undesirable, unquote. After he refused to apologize, Eugene Debs called Roosevelt, quote, a cowboy in imitation, unquote. 
Clarence Darrow was brought in to lead the defense of the Idaho Three, who were now facing the death penalty. The case hinged on the bomber's credibility, which was non-existent. At one point in the trial, Darrow called the bomber, quote, the most monumental liar that ever existed, unquote. This makes sense, considering that bomber Albert E. Horsley had been using a fake name, Harry Orchard, throughout the entire proceedings. The three were all either acquitted or had their charges dropped. Big Bill's fame and the notoriety of the IWW were skyrocketing. Emma Goldman compared the New York City radicals who fawned over Big Bill to a, quote, bunch of giggling girls fawning over the physical prowess of a quarterback, unquote. Unfortunately for the IWW, the disparate ideological differences which encompassed the Union were too vast to overcome. East and West split. The Western miners left the group altogether, and Debs and his Socialist Party would break away as well as Daniel D. Leon's Socialist Labor Party. These two political parties found huge traction with immigrant communities. Jewish people latched on to organizing, much the same way the Irish had done with local politics during the previous generation. In spite of the spats and breakaways, the IWW was proving incredibly effective at militant organizing. They originated the sit-down strike in Schenectady, New York. Following this, they won a nine-hour day for Portland, Oregon sawmill workers. The achievements did not stop there. In Goldfield, Nevada, the IWW won the workers a daily wage of $4.50. Adjusted for inflation, this is almost $150 a day. Finally, in McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania, the pressed steel car strike of 1909 cascaded into violence. Armed horsemen rode down striking workers, while a sheriff's deputy was beaten to death by an angry mob for evicting a family from their homes the previous day. In all, 13 people were killed, most being strikers and innocent bystanders. The Wobblies were causing quite the fracas. The IWW was fed like a steam engine, but instead of taking in coal, it took in the orator Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and turned her rhetoric into pure kinetic energy. She arrived on the scene like a primary color thunderbolt, adorned in a long black skirt, a starch white blouse, and a blazing red necktie. She would captivate audiences in every hovel and slum in the country and gain a huge personal following. In 1909, she was in Missoula, Montana, where itinerant workers were being targeted by employment agencies. When the IWW arrived, its members were thrown into jail, so Flynn decided to overwhelm the jailhouses. Wobblies from all corners of the nation began to arrive in the sleepy Montana town, and in no time, local jails were bursting at the seams with Wobblies, who would sing socialist songs at full voice and at all hours. It was now costing Masula a substantial amount of money to keep the hundreds of Wobblies interred. They released the men in their custody, but hundreds returned, pounding on the jailhouse doors seeking to be admitted once more. People would come from neighboring towns to watch the novel sight of men attempting to break into jail. Raised by socialist Irish parents, it's little wonder Elizabeth Gurley Flynn became the person she did. At 16, she was arrested alongside her father for daring to display the red flag in Times Square. She would be in and out of jail her whole life. Flynn believed the end of capitalism was imminent. One need only see the heaps of dead bodies the state had murdered in the past years to understand that something was fundamentally wrong with this system. She carried the lessons learned in Missoula to a much larger city, Spokane, Washington. Here, like in most places during the time, there was worker unrest due to the atrocious working conditions allowed by employers. Like in Missoula, mass arrests began. One man was arrested as he read the Declaration of Independence aloud. 
The Spokane authorities reacted to the singing and banging of hundreds of wobblies by confining them into smaller and smaller cells, while also denying them blankets and heated rooms. This barbaric treatment of protesters made many incredibly ill, and four months of confinement broke many a wobbly spirit. Flynn, who was with child at the time, arrived in March of 1910, and she was immediately arrested for making a speech. While in lockup, she claimed many women were forced into prostitution by the Spokane police. When it came time for her trial, the foreman of the jury said to the judge, quote, If you think this jury, or any jury, is going to send that pretty Irish girl to jail merely for being big-hearted and idealistic, you've got another guest coming, unquote. Mired in scandal and accruing debts from the hundreds arrested, the will of Spokane was smashed by a mother-to-be. They agreed to terms with the IWW. Free speech was once again threatened. This time, the authorities of Fresno, New Mexico, were incensed that the IWW was organizing workers. They denied the union the right to gather publicly and promised to arrest any and all who were not employed for vagrancy. Leading the local IWW was Frank Little, a white and Cherokee labor organizer. The same strategy of packing jails was attempted, and the Fresno jailhouse became saturated with wobblies. Fresno quickly agreed to the IWW's demands. However, in San Diego, these same tactics failed, as Southern California was in the midst of its own quasi-Red Scare. On October 1, 1910, the L.A. Times headquarters was bombed in a terrorist attack of unprecedented violence. In the rubble, the carcasses of 21 people were uncovered, and accusations began to fly at once. Conservatives claimed that this was the work of a violent unionist conspiracy, while labor advocates claimed the explosion was the result of a reported gas leak, and they rushed to the accused's aid. The two brothers accused of planting the bomb were John and James McNamara. After one of their accomplices stepped forward and agreed to testify for the state, James admitted he set the bomb to frighten the times and cause them to rethink their open shop stance. James also admitted he did not think the bomb would do as much damage as it did, and the supposed gas leak may have played a part in the ensuing fire. Regardless, labor leaders across the country felt they had been betrayed, as such negative publicity did massive harm to the labor movement. It solidified once more the threat of radicalism, and solidified in permanent ink the violent anarchist bomb thrower caricature. In Lawrence, Massachusetts, textile workers had been bristling in their factories. Much like the neighboring city of Lowell, Lawrence was one of the first great manufacturing hubs of the pre-Civil War Northeast. However, that luster had long dimmed. The classic problems of companies using strike breakers and the spread of mechanization took their toll on the city's workforce. Wages remained stagnant, and people suffered the unrelenting creep of poverty. 90% of the city's population were either Italian, Slavic, Belgian, Portuguese, Syrian, German, or French-Canadian immigrants. When the American Wool Company announced the wage cut, the mill workers struck. Mill workers were some of the poorest paid workers in the entire nation, so this makes sense. A further depreciation of wages would mean starvation. American Wool claimed the reduction in wages was necessary because of the, quote, iron law of competition, unquote. The Wobblies were small in Lawrence, only having a handful of members in their local chapter. But they called for aid from the national office. On January 12th, in the snow, 30,000 textile workers marched out of their factories after receiving their decreased pay stubs they proceeded to destroy machinery and vandalize government property. Answering the call to arms from the national office, Joseph Etter arrived in Massachusetts. Etter was a New York City-based socialist who is best known for his jovial appearance, appearing in mugshots with an infectious grin and wearing a powder blue suit and tie. 
His father was injured in the Haymarket affair, so radicalism seethed in the Edder house. Instead of being read Alice in Wonderland, Edder was regaled with stories of the martyrs of American labor as a boy. Edder was a down-to-earth speaker, which made him instantly relatable to almost any audience. Unlike the brawling and aggressive Big Bill Haywood, Edder promoted nonviolence as the most surefire way to win the strike. He understood that public perception meant everything, and only with a sympathetic populace could a strike succeed in any meaningful way. In spite of the nonviolence of those striking, the authorities turned hoses on the crowd on the freezing morning of January 15th. This act infuriated the strikers. The soldiers followed this up by going through the crowds and jabbing women and children with the ends of their bayonets. When this failed to disperse the strikers, authorities turned to divide and conquer tactics, attempting to turn the many nationalities on one another. Edder recognized this tactic and he told his strikers, quote, Our enemies are making an effort to blind the issue by making a cry of foreigners, rioters, to which we may reply, we were not considered foreigners when we meekly consented to being robbed of our labors and opportunities. We were considered good citizens as long as we were traitors to our best interests, unquote. On January 20th, Lawrence Authority stormed the slums of the city and supposedly discovered three stashes of dynamite. One was in the Italian ghetto, another was in the Syrian ghetto, and the last one was found, quote, in the open, unquote, near a local cemetery. Three people were brought in for questioning, including an Italian cobbler, a Syrian tailor, and a, quote, Porto Rican, unquote. Misinformation spread like wildfire, and there was general panic amongst the powers that be. On January 24th, Big Bill arrived on the scene to a thunderous ovation. Mounting a box, Big Bill looked into the faces of thousands of workers and said, quote, There is no foreigner here except the capitalist. Unquote. On January 29th, tragedy changed the complexion of the entire strike. In a scene similar to the Boston Massacre, the citizens of Massachusetts hurled ice and rocks through windows and at local police forces. The police rushed this mob, and in the melee which ensued, a gunshot struck and killed 33-year-old Anna Lopizzo. The next day, John Ramey, a Syrian immigrant, was chased down and killed by local militia for throwing ice. That night, Edder was arrested and accused of being involved in Anna Lopizzo's death. Alongside Edder, a local Italian poet, Arturo Giovannitti, was also arrested and charged. Their crime was that they instigated Anna's death with their, quote, incendiary words, unquote. The authorities were trying to kill those who spoke up. In this case, it was an even more egregious breach of justice than in the Haymarket affair, as both Edder and Giovannitti both advocated nonviolence. Joseph Caruso, a local worker, was also arrested and charged with the murder of Anna. Big Bill Haywood and the IWW rallied to the defense of the accused. Returning to New York, Haywood would spend his time raising money for the striking workers, telling the congregation, quote, They are the persons who clothe you, and yet they are the persons who are naked, unquote. Back in Lawrence, a public relations coup was about to shift public opinion to the strikers' side. Italian workers stepped forward and brought a piece of the old country to the new. Labor disputes could last for many months in Italy of this period, so striking workers were used to long work actions. These same workers would often send their children to live with relatives to ease the financial burden on those striking. They proposed the same thing could be done in Lawrence. Houses opened their doors as far away as Philadelphia to any children of strikers in Lawrence. Chaperoned by Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and Margaret Sanger, the first trainload of 119 children left Lawrence in February. It arrived at Grand Central Station and was greeted by 5,000 supporters who sang La Masaise. The children, 
left the train in teams, shouting, quote, Who are we? Who are we? Who are we? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Strikers. 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 Unquote. These children were underclothed and underfed. A volunteer doctor claimed many eight-year-olds were so underdeveloped and malnourished, quote, as to appear to be only four, unquote. The IWW claimed there were a thousand, quote-unquote, strike waifs ready to be sent out of Lawrence. The leadership of Lawrence became incensed and many argued that children need not be sent away and that this was a horrible use of children for political ends. They claimed the IWW was being neglectful to the children. How could it ever be the Lawrence textile magnates who paid their workers only $3 a week? Regardless of how ludicrous this assertion was, the authorities forbade any children being sent away. This order was legally dubious, but it did not matter. On February 24th, 46 children were arrayed in front of the train station, ready to be sent away. The police met the children and their chaperones and attempted to hustle the children away. The mothers would intercede and several were arrested and loaded with their children to jail. The jail was swarmed by the irate men of the town, and they were in turn laid low by the police truncheon and baton. The strike was entering its third month. The exodus of the children and subsequent arrests of many mothers turned Lawrence authorities into monsters in the press. Having no allies and constantly losing money, the American Wool Company agreed to workers' demands. Philip Dre says the workers of Lawrence won, quote, improvements in hours and benefits were granted, and wages raised by between 5 and 25 percent. New adjustments were agreed to for overtime, and the mills consented to rehire the workers who had gone out. Many other textile mills in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire fell in line with the American Wool Company's realignments. It was estimated the strikers had won millions of dollars in concessions for their fellow textile mill workers throughout New England. Unquote. Three men still had charges of murder over their heads, and the IWW was pulling out all the stops to try to combat the authorities in the courtroom. Outside the courthouse, demonstrations and speeches were still being held in support of the workers who died. Leading these protests was Carlo Tresca, the lover of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. He was probably the most provocative and violent wobbly, but because most of his speeches were made in Italian, the media could not demonize him properly. His flashing of a banner which read, No Gods, No Masters, was a serious PR nightmare for the IWW. The conservative community rallied, and many religious immigrants were put off by the French Revolutionary message. In the courtroom, Edder, Giovannitti, and Caruso were defended by Clarence Darrow, famous for his defense of Scopes and countless other progressives. In spite of all attempts by authorities to present the three as violent lunatics, even having the defendants kept behind iron bars for the duration of the trial, it was pretty obvious the state charged these men for their opinions. Additionally, new evidence surfaced during witness testimony, and it became apparent that the police were most likely responsible for the murder of Anna Lopizzo. After two months, all three defendants were acquitted. The final victory at Lawrence had been won. There needn't be any martyrs today. Lawrence was a crowning achievement for the IWW and the labor movement in America. It showed how a nonviolent, multi-ethnic group of people could overcome the authoritarian machinations of the elite and powerful, simply through force of will and solidarity. Patterson, New Jersey, had long been a hub of radicalism. Italian anarchist Giovante Pesante was radicalized in New Jersey before returning to Italy to shoot King Umberto I. During the first decades of the labor movement, New Jersey feelings was a phrase used to describe an agitated workforce because of Patterson's intense radicalism. In 1913, the silk industry employed a quarter of the town's population. In the years previous to this, women and children had been introduced into the employment pool, 
which was depreciating the wages of men, as employers paid women and children less for the same work. With the introduction of new loom technology, fewer workers were needed to work more machines. This was unacceptable, as the workforce was already stretched thin, and after an entire grievance committee was fired, tensions were ramped up exponentially. On March 3rd, 25,000 silk workers struck, demanding an 8-hour day and a 12-hour minimum wage. Unfortunately, the IWW had recently been crushed in their attempts to unionize New York City's restaurant workers. In a scandalous incident, Flynn and Tresca were struck with police batons and arrested, but not before Tresca dropped a book of poems given to him by another woman who declared her love for him. The scandal was just another blow to the American labor movement and the IWW. Patterson officials took note of the NYPD's no-nonsense clubbing of wobblies. If they tried to fill the jails in Patterson, they would do so with concussions. John Reed, a sympathetic journalist, arrived to write on the events in Patterson. In an uncharacteristic move, the IWW chose not to confront Patterson authorities and moved much of the protests to the neighboring town of Halden, which had recently elected a socialist mayor. From just over the town border, the IWW gave speeches and marched, seemingly unharassed. However, at one point, Patterson police crossed town lines and even arrested the socialist mayor for, quote, malfeasance, unquote. The IWW attempted another exodus of children, but it failed to garner the same sympathy from the press. Conservative elements attempted to counter the IWW, declaring March 17th Flag Day. In response, workers carried a litany of American flags with banners attached, which read, quote, We weave the flag, we live under the flag, we die under the flag, but damned if we'll starve under the flag, unquote. On April 19th, a stone-throwing group of strikers was met by private detective gunfire. Valentino Modestino, a husband, father, and innocent bystander, was killed. After promising Modestino's pregnant widow that she would be cared for by the Union, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn says, quote, Iron entered my soul. I became and remain a mortal enemy of capitalism. I will never rest contented until I see it replaced by a government of the people, led by the working class. Unquote. The Patterson strike ended in disaster and humiliation for the IWW. John Reed put forward a peculiar new idea to raise funds for the strikers. He claimed a, quote, workers' pageant, unquote, which starred the workers themselves and labor leaders, would be a groundbreaking new art form. Unfortunately, the production costs and rent for the venue far exceeded the minuscule profit they made. Finally fed up with going hungry, the silk workers of Patterson returned to their posts. Throughout the West, and especially in southern Colorado, miners usually suffered in silence. They had no sympathetic lawmaker or journalist on their side. They were almost all migrants. Many were from Greece, the Tyrol region in Italy, Sicily, Wales, Austria, Bohemia, the Spanish Americas, and every place in between. Following the first machinations of worker insurrection, Western mine operators decided the best way to control the lives of their workers was through the implementation of company houses and stores. At first, they did this as a well-meaning gesture, as most company houses were leagues above the hastily constructed migrant shanties. However, these company structures had no character. Previously, migrants would build amongst their own people and use their own architectural stylings when designing their houses. It made a diverse mosaic of varying structures. Company houses rarely differed in style, and the amenities offered were taken out of the rent. Corruption became the norm, as the associated company store would usually overcharge miners, who were only paid in script. Additionally, all aspects of town life were controlled. It was as bad as the most blockheaded Soviet policy, and violence was rampant because of it. Now, instead of just being angry at your boss for your meager pay, 
you could be rightfully angry at your boss over the food you eat and the place you sleep. All semblance of mining culture and its individual nature were being riven away, and women and children at home usually took the brunt of the anger which manifested. The United Mine Workers had attempted to unionize the southern Colorado cold fields before. In response, owners lashed out bitterly against the Union, stonewalling them at every turn. Through force of arms and the threat of starvation, the original strike effort failed. In 1912, the UMW set out again to unionize the company towns of Fremont, Huerfano, and Las Animas counties. They used something called the inside-outside technique. Thomas G. Andrew says, quote, One organizer, the outside man, sought work in a closed camp, where he secretly began to recruit potential union sympathizers. The inside man, meanwhile, ingratiated himself with mine officials. Having won their trust, he then volunteered to help root out suspected unionists. Unquote. Instead of doing that, the inside man gave the names of non-union workers. Managers must have fired and displaced hundreds of loyal employees simply based on the words of a single smooth talker. By late summer of 1913, the three main monopolies in Colorado, Colorado Fuel and Iron, Victor American and Rocky Mountain Fuel, had caught wise to the inside-outside game and began cracking down on many unionists in their camps. They hired Baldwin Feltz detectives to protect their closed camps. The Baldwin Feltz were basically bargain brand Pinkertons, but that did not stop them from murdering a union organizer in the streets of Trinidad, Colorado. Having a martyr to rally behind, the UMW organized a meeting which would call for a potential strike. Thousands of miners arrived singing the Colorado Strike Song, written by the UMW's vice president to the tune of the battle cry of freedom. The final stanza goes, quote, We are fighting for our rights, boys. We're fighting for our homes, shouting the battle cry of union. Men have died to win the struggle. They've died to set us free, shouting the battle cry of union, unquote. Colorado was one of the states that was largely ravaged by mining disasters. In 1913, 104 people had already died in gas leaks, explosions, fires, and other accidents. Miners were not paid for putting up beams which could save their lives. This practice was called dead work, and depending on the stability of the room in which you were mining, dead work was sometimes necessary to prevent a total cave-in. One of the meager concessions for which the miners asked was to at least be paid for this dead work. Fremont County Delegate T.X. Evans said of the strike meeting, quote, I was never looking for a strike. But the evidence that was given by the delegate representing the different camps was heartbreaking. There was one man who spoke pretty fair English. He said he had a partner, and the boss told him, Now you have to go take this mule today and drive. The fellow said, I cannot drive. I have never drove a mule in my life. The boss told him he had to do it, and he went to take that mule, and the mule balked on him. And in the fighting with the mule, he was catched between the car and the ribs, and it squeezed him and broke something on his inside, and he lay there, and he died. I did not see why it should occur." Unquote. After testimony from countless miners at the Trinidad meeting, the men unanimously agreed to strike for better working conditions. The UMW demanded a 10% increase in wages and tonnage rates, an eight-hour day, pay for all dead work, a check weight man to be elected by the miners, the right to trade in any store the miner wanted, the upholding of state law, and the acknowledgement of the union. And yes, you heard that right. These three monopolies were in direct violation of Colorado state law in regards to their mining practices. The UMW set September 23rd as the date of the strike. Mother Jones had arrived to support the strikers. She was now in her 80s 
She rose and said, quote, Rise up and strike. If you are too cowardly, there are enough women in the country to come here and beat the hell out of you. If it is to be slavery or strike, then I say strike. Strike until the last one of you drops into your graves. Unquote. Frank Hayes, vice president of the UMW, was next. He pledged, quote, never to leave this field until they had stricken the shackles from every mine worker, unquote. A hush fell over the assembled delegates. They had just signed off on 9,000 miners leaving work. Fear replaced their jubilant mood of only several hours ago. It was in this foreboding climate that, from the back of the hall, a single voice began to shakily sing the Colorado Strike Song. It grew in power and spread to the assembled until, in one solid, gravelly voice, the battle cry of union resounded through the hills and arroyos of Colorado coal country. The strike had been going on for a month when the first National Guardsmen began arriving to defend private property. Already in the deep woods and hills, murders, ambuscades, and assaults were commonplace. And there were even whispers that the Sons of Mali were at work in southern Colorado. At the strike's inception, many thousands of people were evicted or chose to leave their homes. These strikers congregated together, and several large tent colonies sprung up. The largest of these was the White City of Ludlow so-called because of the white canvas tents which the UMW set up. Around these tent cities, gun battles raged between private detectives and miners. So as a precaution, miners dug pits in the earth to keep women and children safe in the event of a shootout. It was hoped the arrival of the National Guard would stop the violence which had already claimed more than two dozen lives. On October 28th, the governor directed the militia to disarm everyone close any and all saloons, require mine guards to stay on their mines, order a posse drawn up from willing citizens, and finally, ensure the safety of any and all who want to work. At first, the National Guard had the desired effect, and many strikers even cheered the units as they arrived. However, it soon became clear there was intense bias among the leaders of this National Guard unit. They enforced their orders unevenly. To make matters worse, the state's pro-union auditor withheld state funds from the men in the field. The coal baron stepped in and offered to shoulder the burden of keeping the unit supplied and equipped. By November, the lines were clearly drawn. John Chase, leader of the National Guard forces, even accepted former mine guards and private detectives into the guardsmen's muster rolls. Opposing them were thousands of armed miners. Many of these miners had seen combat, having fought in Italy's capture of Libya from the Ottoman Empire, the Greek wars against the Ottomans, the Balkan Wars, and the First Sino-Japanese War. They had already proved themselves equal to the private mine detectives in military prowess. Whether they would engage with the National Guard remained to be seen, for now both sides bristled and prepared for a possible fight. In an attempt to stop the strike, three striking miners met with three top-ranking coal executives. The executives could not understand how the strike began in the first place. They blamed the UMW for attempting to bring in outside agitators and thereby forcing the executives into negotiations. They claimed unions forced workers into not exerting themselves to the fullest and thus held back many miners from advancing in life. The miners refused to be drawn into a debate on upward mobility with three multi-millionaires. They stuck to the facts and said the strike was not due to outside agitators, but because of unsafe working conditions and fed-up locals. The miners claimed the owners cared and understood little about the mines they operated. To prove the point, when a coal baron was asked if he had a blueprint to the mine he owned, he responded, quote, what is the point about that? Unquote. To drive home the fact that these three coal barons were divorced from any semblance of reality, another claimed his company pays dearly for every mine explosion. <laughs>
at which a flabbergasted miner responded, quote, Yes, and we pay dear too, with our lives, unquote. The same miner says later, quote, You people don't know what is going on. And if you people were in closer touch with what is going on at these mines, I believe you would change your minds yourself, unquote. Did any of these executives take the miner's advice? No. Not until the bodies filled the morgues, forcing their hand. Defending the Union, the miners claimed they were an ultimate good. The Union provided two insurmountable positives. Firstly, it educated and insulated foreign miners who otherwise would have very little experience in mines. Secondly, they offered protection for pit committees. Thomas G. Andrews says pit committees were, quote, ad hoc bodies that British Americans traditionally formed to present grievances and demands to operators, unquote. These two factors made unionization essential and introduced much more democracy into the workplace. The UMW was simply the official extension of unofficial practices in which the miners had always participated. The miners argued the union would actually prevent grievances or at least settle them quickly. Underling for John D. Rockefeller, John Osgood, responded, quote, Is that just to the operators? Unquote. The governor pleaded with the operators to at least uphold state law, but it was to no avail. Without union recognition, any victory won by the workers could be easily rescinded by the operators, so miners refused to budge. With union recognition, mine operators would be forced to sign closed shop contracts with quote-unquote undemocratic unions. This was the first and last attempt at a negotiation between operator and laborer before solitary instances of violence devolved into a full-blown war. Following the conference, a letter was penned to Rockefeller stating, quote, We reached no direct understanding. In fact, we wanted none. Nevertheless, the conference accomplished a great deal of good, as it convinced the governor that the grievances of the men were of a trivial character. Unquote. New orders were given to the deployed National Guard. They were to step up arrests of strike leaders, and they would hold the most without charges. These strikers would be charged by a military tribunal for their quote-unquote crimes. Commander Chase then issued the notorious General Order 17, which made it much easier for coal operators to import strike breakers. Crowds of 100 or more were now to be dispersed by National Guardsmen. It was a dangerous sign of what was to come. As winter descended, the tent colonies of the UMW did all they could to keep warm. Every other day, labor leaders were arrested and interrogated with the assistance of company officials. The strike was losing momentum, and the hopes of some sort of coal shortage proved fleeting, as other mines ramped up production nationwide to meet demands. At the same time, Pro-Union congressmen authorized a federal investigation into conditions in southern Colorado. John D. Rockefeller Jr. testified to Congress. Thomas G. Andrews says that, quote, His father was so pleased with him that he promptly gave his son 10,000 shares in Colorado fuel and iron, unquote. These hearings made both sides look monstrous, as both seemed intent on violence to solve the dispute rather than diplomacy. In February 1914, the governor withdrew most of the militia stationed in southern Colorado, leaving only a paltry force of 200 men, most of whom were former mine guards and detectives. Through the hard winter, the morale of the strikers had been boosted, and Union captains began arriving. Among these captains was Louis Tikas, a Greek miner known for his eloquence and organizing ability. He quickly rallied the morale of the Greek miners and other migrants in the Ludlow tent colony. In early March, Chase was methodically destroying smaller and isolated tent colonies. One woman whose temporary home was destroyed was Emma Zantel. Her home had already been dynamited by anti-union gangs in the 1890s, and now with two newborn children, Emma watched her tent home burn in the cold. Both children would become sick, and die of exposure. 
By mid-April, only two small companies of 34 soldiers remained under the direct command of Lieutenant Carl Linderfelt. Even though Rockefeller's underlings assured him the strike was, quote, wearing itself out, unquote, the strikers interpreted the militia's departure as a sign that they were winning and their spirits rose. At this point, armed strikers vastly outnumbered the National Guard, and many of its members were terrified that the miners could assault and wipe out the meager militia. In preparation for such a move, the National Guard took position on the hills surrounding the Ludlow tent colony. It was a recipe for disaster. The strikers were emboldened and the guardsmen were terrified. Both sides eagerly awaited the spark which would begin the fighting. Thirty had already been killed in the hills of Colorado. The coming battle, or massacre, was seemingly inevitable. What happened on April 20th is largely up for debate. Here's what we know happened. Militia leaders met with Louis Tecas with the claim that a non-union worker was being held hostage inside the camp. During this meeting, strikers began to nervously, quote, mill about, unquote. This worried Major Patrick Hamrock, and he ordered his men into position in case something happened. A single shot went off, we will never know who fired it, and all hell broke loose in Ludlow. A beautiful spring morning had descended into a full-fledged field battle between miners who had combat experience and militiamen who had the high ground. The fighting contingent of the strikers attempted to lead the militia away from their wives and children, lest they be caught in a deadly crossfire. This idea, likely conceived in panic, proved tragic beyond comprehension. The National Guard descended on the tent colony like a 13th century Mongol horde, but not before raking the tents with gatling gun and rifle fire. Some miners contend that the National Guard was using explosive ammunition in violation of Rule 78 of the Geneva Conventions. Regardless of their ammunition, guardsmen may have initiated a fire either through inadvertently hitting the miners' ammunition or by purposefully setting the tents ablaze with torches. Either way, there was likely no way they could have known that two women and 13 children were under the colony, attempting to hide in the earth from the gunfire which raged above them. Louis Tecas was still meeting with militia leaders Hamrock and Linderfeld when he heard the firing beginning. He understood all too well what was happening. He was a zouave in his native Greece. He begged that the women and children of the colony be spared. In response, Carl Linderfeld cracked Louis Tecas over the skull with the end of his rifle, and Tecas, alongside two other organizers, were shot in the back and killed. In total, at least 19 people were killed, most being unarmed women, children, and strike leaders. Upon learning that their wives, children, and leaders were dead, the remaining miners, who were now scattered around the hills, swore righteous vengeance on the remaining militiamen. A campaign of terrorism and violence, the likes of which had not been seen in America since the Civil War, gripped southern Colorado. The miners used their inherent knowledge of the land to mount fast and effective guerrilla raids. This campaign of devastation is known to history as the Ten Days War. This war was waged above Union leaders' heads, as the UMW had actually signed a treaty with coal operators. However, this wasn't about wages anymore. It was about getting even and then some. The strikers turned soldiers had no uniform, no means of supply, and were armed with hunting rifles and shotguns. Their only recognizable feature was the red handkerchief they wore around their necks. Militia derisively called the miners rednecks, but when confronted by them, militia units found themselves easily overwhelmed. One National Guardsman said the miners were, quote, ten times better soldiers than we were, unquote. A week following Ludlow, the miners had exacted body for body the punishment the militia inflicted on their wives and children. But the miners, compelled by an unquantifiable blood fury, hungered for more. Thomas G. Andrew says, quote, On the morning of April 29th, 300 Greeks, Italians, Slavs, and Mexicans all figured prominently. At 
two shots signaled the strikers that they should sally forth against six state militiamen and more than two dozen mine officials and strike breakers. At 700 yards, strikers opened fire with steel jacketed bullets. Forbes's defenders proved no match for the miners. The camp fell in less than an hour. Unquote. The massacre began in earnest. Strike breakers and mine officials were shot and beaten and then had their bodies burned beyond recognition. Remember Ludlow was the cry of the miners. Peace only came once the women of Colorado had had enough of their state being governed into a war zone. They demanded the governor call on President Wilson to send out federal troops and that the fighting be stopped. The governor, Amons, remained incompetent at best throughout the Ludlow crisis and helped it along at worst. When confronted by the mothers and daughters of his state, at first he refused to meet with them. After hours of public shaming, he agreed to meet with the delegates with whom the women marched. Even then, the governor claimed he could not ask the president for federal intervention, as the federal government was busy invading Veracruz, Mexico, to protect U.S. assets there. Galvanized once more by the women of his state, the governor finally asked for and was given federal troops to deploy to the southern coal fields. Not wishing to fight federal troops, striking miners did all they could to hasten their destruction of mines and mining equipment before these troops arrived. By April 28th, the U.S. Army was in the field, and the Ten Days' War was over. John D. Rockefeller, Governor Amons, and the other coal barons of Colorado had much to answer for in regards to the Ludlow Massacre. All three did all they could to wash their hands of the dead mothers and children. Amons was called upon to resign, while citizens called on Amons to, quote, purge, unquote, Rockefeller's company from the state. The socialist editorial Appeal to Reason lampooned Rockefeller, writing in verse, quote, As long as he has the cash to spend, it's easy the people to fool. As long as he builds a cottage or two and teaches Sunday school, the toads fawn and the lick spittles kneel. He's worshipped by all the freaks, while the bodies of little children are burned beneath Colorado's peaks. And this skulking, sanctimonious ass, this breeder of crime and hate, with the greed of a jackal and a heart of brass, whines nothing to arbitrate. Unquote. The murderers of Louis Tecas walked free and not a single striker's testimony was heard. The military tribunal said that Hamrock had quote-unquote aired when ordering machine guns to be used on strikers, and they said Linderfeld was wrong for killing Tecas, but they declined to pursue any criminal charges. John D. Rockefeller felt he could avoid all criticism of Ludlow by sticking to his story and staying in New York, but the anger followed him to the big city. New York at this time was experiencing an unprecedented revolt of the unemployed. Hundreds of thousands sought sanctuary in churches. In response, churches hired street toughs to throw out any vagrants, just as Jesus would have. Police had a difficult time rounding up the roving bands of poor people, but once discovered, they were usually beaten senseless and arrested. Only personal intervention by muckraker journalist Lincoln Steffens ended some of the most terrifying abuses. Upton Sinclair, another muckraker, organized the mass protest movement against Rockefeller. In a more radical move, socialist students at the Rand Institute interrupted church services at Rockefeller's local church. They asked the father presiding over that Sunday's Mass if, quote, Jesus would uphold John D. Rockefeller in his attitude toward the Colorado strikers, unquote. Seeing the protests had followed him, Rockefeller escaped to Terrytown, a scenic Hudson River escape in upstate New York. Protesters followed him there, too. Village police refused all protest permits and reacted harshly when New York City radicals arrived in their conservative town. It appears they had reason to worry. Three anarchists were killed when a bomb they had planned to place in Rockefeller's home detonated prematurely. In spite of no personal harm befalling Rockefeller, his reputation was seemingly tarnished. 
Many leftists referred to events in Colorado as, quote, Rockefeller's War, unquote. Rockefeller had been waging a press campaign to save face, but it was simply not enough. He would have to actually address some issues to get the activists off his back. He hired Mackenzie King, former Canadian Deputy Minister of Labor, to lead a, quote, fact-finding inquiry, unquote. Next, Philip Dre says, quote, Rockefeller formally announced that CFI, Colorado Fuel and Iron, was now prepared to concede certain improvements to Colorado miners, only to learn that many of these privileges were already the law in Colorado, unquote. Rockefeller proceeded to visit Colorado for the first time in his life, and his natural charisma and diplomatic airs worked wonders on the people with whom he spoke. He insisted the absentee capitalism in which he participated was part of the problem and promised to do better by his workers from here on out. To that end, Rockefeller created a company union for the CFI to better represent his workers. But this pseudo-union failed on many of its promises and participated in bias. Throughout the country, disturbances and rebellions were spreading like wildfire. In Michigan's copper country, 14,000 copper miners struck for nearly a year between 1913 and 1914. Following the assassination of two Croatian immigrants, the strike grew increasingly violent. Then, at a packed Christmas Eve party, someone, many claim a mine operator or lackey, yelled fire causing a massive stampede which killed 73 men, women, and children. Between 1912 and 1913, a similarly violent coal war exploded in Kanawha County, West Virginia. Mother Jones was on site to rally the strikers, later being arrested and charged by a military tribunal. During the course of the strike, over 50 Unionists would be killed by mine operators and Baldwin Feltz detectives. I wish I could say these were the last great wars between miners and their employers. But unfortunately, the more violent both sides became, the harder compromise was to achieve. Coal and labor uprisings and wars would continue throughout the American countryside for decades to come, with the largest only just beginning to foment in West Virginia. We end today's episode with the death of a single man. He was born Joel Hagland, but history remembers him by his chosen name, Joe Hill. Arriving in America from Sweden, he was the third of nine children whose father was a train conductor. When his father died young, the Hagland family was at the precipice of financial disaster. But Joe's mother managed to keep their heads above water until her untimely death in Joe's early 20s. Having few prospects and almost laid low by tuberculosis in Sweden, Joe and his brother left for America in either 1901 or 1902. He traveled the country, likely riding the rails, and found himself in San Francisco when the great earthquake ripped apart whole city blocks in 1906. He found work after the quake at a rope factory. At around the same time, he changed his name, perhaps to escape the blacklist. In 1910, he became a dues-paying member of the IWW and participated in the aforementioned Fresno and San Diego free speech strikes. It was during these strikes, and with the IWW, that Joe Hill discovered his true calling, songwriting. He took to the practice quickly and wrote labor songs which are still sung today in union halls across the country. Workers of the world awaken. There is power in a union and Union Made are but a few of the classic songs written to the popular music of Joe Hill's time. They all follow a pro-union and anti-capitalist message, which was common for most Wobblies to preach. In truth, Joe Hill was amongst a number of, quote, hobo folk composers, unquote, who would go on to inspire folk artists like Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, and eventually Bob Dylan. What made Joe Hill famous was the circumstances of his death. On January 10, 1914, John and Arling Morrison were shot dead in a botched robbery. Merlin Morrison, the surviving 13-year-old son of John, claimed the killers entered his father's house shouting, quote, We've got you now! Unquote. No money or valuables were stolen, and no murder weapon was ever discovered. 
However, before being killed, Arling Morrison managed to return fire and strike one of his assassins. That same night, Joe Hill was in the local hospital seeking treatment for a gunshot wound in his shoulder. Hill claimed he was shot over a quarrel with a woman whose name Joe Hill refused to give for the sake of her quote-unquote honor. This lack of any clear alibi was all Utah authorities needed to arrest and charge the Wobbly with the double murder. Unfortunately for the authorities, Joe Hill had only just arrived, so he had no motive, and the evidence was highly circumstantial. But due to the charged climate of the time, the authorities believed they had found the perfect foreigner scapegoat. Joe Hill now had to prove his innocence to escape conviction. Hill tried to make the trial about the facts instead of a witch hunt against supposed wobblies, going as far as asking the Union to stop raising money for his defense. Leftist and moderate Union supporters threw their weight behind Hill in the effort to get him acquitted. In Hill's words, quote, I have no desire to be one of them, what do you call them, martyrs. On the square, I'll tell you that this notoriety stuff is making me dizzy in the head, and I am afraid I'm getting more glory than I really am entitled to, unquote. His execution date neared, and desperate leftists like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn attempted to appeal to President Wilson directly. For his part, Wilson attempted to get Utah authorities to halt the executions not once but twice, but these attempts were rebuked. Hill wrote a final letter to Big Bill Haywood, who was still doing everything in his power to prevent Hill's execution. In the letter, it says, quote, Goodbye, Bill. I will die like a true blue rebel. Don't waste any time in mourning. Organize. Unquote. His final request was to be cremated outside of state lines, writing, quote, I don't want to be found dead in Utah. Unquote. A final will, written in verse, was discovered in Joe Hill's prison cell following his death by firing squad. It reads, quote, My will is easy to decide, for there is nothing to divide. My kin don't need to fuss and moan. Moss does not cling to a rolling stone. My body, oh, if I could choose, I would to ashes it reduce. And let the merry breezes blow, my dust to where some flowers grow. Perhaps some fading flower, then, would come to life and bloom again. This is my last and final will. Good luck to all of you, Joe Hill." Unquote. With respect to his final wishes, Joe Hill's remains were sent to Chicago. The labor agitator and songwriter was cremated after being murdered for a crime he probably did not commit. The remains were then sent across the country in 600 individual envelopes and released together. One envelope was confiscated by the U.S. Postal Service as the employees worried of the incendiary effect it would have. The last of Joe Hill's remains would remain under government safeguard until the late 1980s, when members of the IWW finally received his ashes. But not the envelope in which they came. In 1990, the last of Joe Hill's ashes were scattered in a remote location in southern Michigan, but not before several wobblies ingested some of the remains. Whether Joe Hill's remains helped some feeble flower to bloom remains unknown, but his sacrifice and the sacrifice of thousands of American workers during this era brought new weight to the new labor movement. In the coming years, the once pro-labor Woodrow Wilson would participate in the destruction not only of the IWW, but of the socialist movement in America. His infamous Espionage Act would lead to thousands of arrests of peaceful anti-war agitators, exiling many American leftists to the four winds, or resigning them to lengthy jail sentences. Following the war an era of turbulence would engulf America, and its rivers, prairies, and mountains would be consumed by unimaginable fears. In the next episode of Turning Tides, we'll discuss the first Red Scare, the Roaring Twenties, and the Floundering Thirties, culminating in the single largest armed uprising in American labor history, 
10,000 West Virginia miners would rise in arms against the federal government on the precipices of Blair Mountain. To uncover more of the secret history of America, you'll have to stick around for the next episode. I'm your host, Joseph Pascone. Thank you all so much for listening and for the immense support I've received with this podcast. If you'd like to help the show reach more people, consider sharing your favorite episode, leaving a written review, or just tell a friend who is also a history nerd. The show is powered by you, and without you, I'd just be speaking into space. So thank you once again. Have a great day, and don't ingest the ashes of your heroes. Uh, please don't do that. It's hella weird. If you like what you heard today, you can support us by donating on PayPal at Turning Tides Podcast One. Thanks for the support and thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, we'd really appreciate it if you take the time to rate and review Turning Tides on whatever platform you use to listen and share the show on social media. It really helps us to bring the show to more listeners. Thank you guys so much. Thank you to everyone for listening. We'd also like to say thank you to Movo Photo. We use their sound equipment for this podcast, as well as all of our other projects at Antics Entertainment. They make great equipment at great prices, and we really appreciate that they make content creating so accessible for indie creators like us. Check them out on social media at Movo Photo, M-O-V-O-P-H-O-T-O. Thank you again.